Welcome everybody uh, to our event today, um, which is uh, all about NLP, nat uh, Natural Language Processing, and its uses in education, healthcare, and business. Uh, my name is Steph Wright. I'm the head of the Scottish AI Alliance. Uh, the Scottish AI Alliance, uh, we are the body tasked with the delivery of Scotland's national AI strategy. Um, if you're not familiar with the strategy, it was launched last year at the end of March 2021. Um, and our vision is for Scotland to become a, a leader in the development and use of trustworthy, ethical and inclusive AI. Um, we recently launched our events program. Um, we, we held our big Scottish AI Summit back in March. Uh, but since then, there was a um, we had a lot of feedback from people that they just wanted stuff more regularly instead of just once a year. So, so we embarked on um, a, a call for uh, an open call for events to be part of our events program and Stuart, who was actually at our summit. So that's fantastic. And this is a, a bit of a follow on uh, from the summit. Uh, responded with this fantastic proposal for this event. So um, so uh, if any of you in the audience would like to uh, hold an event with us, please get in touch. Um, today I'm joined by my colleague Dawn Hunter. She's our project manager. Um, so she's going to be technical support, but we're hoping that all works fine. Um, so how it's going to go today is I'll uh, introduce you to our three fantastic speakers, and then I'm going to hand over to them. Um, we're going to, they're all going to have about 10, uh, 10 or so minutes each. Uh, Stuart will have a double presentation. Uh, first, initially, a general intro to NLP and then about its uses in education. And then we're going to head to Lorna and then Gianluca. Um, and then we'll uh, launch into questions from the audience. So please, you know, type in your questions into the chat as they're speaking. Please do so that, yeah, don't wait till they're done. If you have any questions, please chuck it in there and then I'll pose them to our panel at the end of the event. Um, and if we run out of time, at the end to answer all your questions, we'll try and follow up with a wee blog maybe uh, where Stuart, Lorna and Jaluka can answer the unanswered questions. Uh, so that uh, so please do send in all your questions on the chat. Uh, and if you have any problems as well, please also post on the chat. Uh, but we checked that everyone's screen sharing works, everyone can hear everyone. So hopefully this is all good. So um, I think without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three speakers today. Uh, I'll kick off with, um, we have Dr. Stuart Gray, um, and he is the founding CEO of Student Voice and a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Um, Student Voice's machine learning models have been used to analyze free text comment data from over 100 UK universities to help them listen to students from typically underrepresented groups. And then uh, we also have Dr. Lona Harper. Uh, she's a clinical scientist and head of software and informatics in the medical devices unit, a specialist unit uh, in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. The medical devices unit specializes in the design, development, and regulation of bespoke medical devices across a range of clinical services. And last but not least, we have Gianluca uh, Maruzella. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO at Indigo AI, a B2B uh, software as a service platform that uses artificial intelligence to improve the communication between businesses and users. I uh, can't wait to hear from them. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Stuart. Hello, Stuart. Hello. Thank you, Steph. And thank you for hosting us today. Hello, everybody. So I'll dive straight in. We've got um, three, three and a half real talks here. So you'll get one and a half from me. I'll give you an intro to what NLP is, as I see it, the basics, and talk about how we use it in student voice for a pass over into to Lorna and Gianluca for the healthcare and more business side of it. So I will just share my slides. Okay, so what is natural language processing, NLP? So it's allowing computers to understand human language. It's acting as that interface, really. So there's um, a lot goes into that. As you can imagine, we are very messy creatures. We use language in lots of different ways. And computers like everything in a very ordered mathematical way. So it's kind of bridged that gap, that bridge, that gap between how computers are able to understand things and how we communicate as humans. So there's two main parts to it. The first part is natural language understanding. So this is the computer being able to pass and understand um, human language. So some examples of this would be speech recognition. So when Alexa or Siri understand your requests, things like named entity recognition. So this is being able to um, understand what a, a human is talking about, the subject they're talking about, for instance, and also things like sentiment analysis, 
Is it a positive sentiment? Are they talking positively about the thing and negatively? Are they being sarcastic or ironic? So um, lots of different topics like this in terms of how can you understand how humans speak? And that can be uh, verbally or can be written. Um, as long as you can convert between the two, the computer doesn't really care. It's more about the structure of the language it's trying to understand. The other part is natural language generation. So this is the other side of the coin, really. This is getting the computer to generate language that makes sense to us. So this is, a, again, a very difficult task, um, but typically found in things like automatic summarization. So all these services that take large amounts of text and produce little abstracts. Having those make sense and still cover the main topics is very difficult. Things like machine translation, Google Translate being the prime example. So um, taking text in one language, through an intermediary structure and then into another language, you've got to, be able to generate text that the computer has to, be able to generate text that makes sense to us. And we are very particular about uh, reading text. We have a very good instinctual grasp of grammar and what is correct and what seems right and what seems wrong. And that's very difficult to fool. And finally, things like question answering, which I'll show a quick example of, is another example of natural language generation. So it's not enough just sometimes to understand the, what is being talked about, it's really important to be able to communicate back to humans from the computer side. So a quick overview of how NLP, natural language processing, was developed. So it started off with a set of rules. As you all know, in school, you probably had drilled into lots of rules about grammar and structure of text and how things are meant to be, what follows what, what a verb or a noun is. So you can take these rules, codify them, and use them to un try and understand um, text. And that works up to a point. But as I said before, natural language, human language is messy, it's flexible, it's changing all the time, it's highly context dependent. So it's actually very difficult to have a, a, a set of rules that cover all that and let you do um, useful things. So instead, the rules are usually used at the lower level to help build structures that the machine learning and higher level models can use. So after the rules uh, based approach, moved on to sort of a statistical approach. So this is where rather than just using the basic rules of grammar to try and understand and generate text, we can instead look at existing text corpora, okay? Big sets of text. Uh, an example of this would be some of the first machine translation actually used the laws produced by the EU um, as its sort of corpora, because any laws in the EU have to be translated into all the member state languages. So you had these laws defined by the EU in German and in French, and like for like, clause A with clause A, you could, the machine could compare the two and get a mapping between um, those two concepts. And this worked really well, as long as it was legal text you're looking at. As soon as you move outside of that domain, then you're in big trouble really, and it falls down. So the statistical approach is good, um, but it's only as good, any, all of these methods are only as good as the data they're trained on. So we need to, to progress that approach in order to get really robust um, natural language processing on the understanding and generating side. Uh, we have to take another step, which is really the use of neural networks. So this allows us by looking at huge amounts of more generic text to get the semantic meaning of um, words of concepts within the text and use these idea of what given words mean, not just the word itself, not just matching word for word, but what's the actual concept behind it and how it relates to other concepts. These neural networks can build up these huge models that allow us, that allow the machine to understand what is said and generate text based on that understanding. And that's where we are today with some very, very powerful tools. So in terms of understanding, there's the more simplistic syntactic side to understanding grammar, and then there's the meaning, which is more complex. So in terms of grammar, I'll just give you a couple of examples of some of the terms you might see in NLP. So one is stemming. So the computer doesn't want to, doesn't need to uh, store the language in the same way we produce it, okay? It's far more efficient for it to have the core concepts and the core words that it can use those to build its models around it, a level of abstraction. So for instance, if we're talking about mover or moved or moves, when we're giving that to the computer, we basically stem it and just give the word, the concept move to the computer. So we basically simplify all these possible variations of a word and just give the core concept to the computer so it can understand it more easily. The, the, um, the natural language processing models also think about parts of speech. They can try and work out 
what type of speech or part of speech a given word is. Is it a noun or a verb? And in English in particular, there's all sorts of weird edge cases of different words in different contexts. So we can give these the very complex grammar rules to these, to these systems to give them a head start. And finally, things like breaking into sentences. Okay, do it at full stops and question marks, but you also get uh, question marks and periods other places in text, for instance, e.g. and i.e. Um, would crop up. So you've got to be quite uh, aware of where these things happen. On the semantic side, as in the meaning, this is where the real meat of the problem is. What's the meaning of words? There's problems around named entity recognition. So what the different, what types of things are in the text? So people, times, companies, places, can you extract those? Uh, relationships between things talked about in the text, that gets very tricky. And then that leads to some very complex use cases like argument mining. So going back to sort of the legal sort of uh, sense, um, can you get a premise of an argument, the main argument, the main parts of that argument, any counter argument? Can you isolate these parts within a bit of text or speech and extract the meaning and the relationship between them? That's a very, very tough um, nut to crack. In terms of generation, we can do automatic summarization. So this is an example. There's a whole range of things we do around generating natural language. This is a good example in that we have to create a model of the supplied text um, so we have to strip it down to its core components, the meaning, the structure, what is being talked about. And then we look at, are any parts repeated? Are any parts more complex that could be simplified down? Remove those complex elements, remove the duplications, and then generate a coherent response based on the, what is left after we've gone through that processing. And then we get to the even harder problem of question answering. And this is very tricky, and, but recently there's been major advances in this, and I can show you a quick demo now. So we can pass and understand mm -hmm. questions, uh, or the natural NLP pipelines can, and then generating a coherent response. So you can think about this as sort of giving it every possible um, question to be asked and a set of answers to give, but you've run out of possibilities there. It's far better actually to use these machine learning approaches to look at a whole load of data and text. And from all that experience of reading different questions and answers and context, the model can in fact just understand what uh, a good answer for any given question may be. So many of you may have heard of GPT-3. This is a model from OpenAI. Um, and it's, there's many models like this, but it basically is trained on billions and billions of examples of text, um, basically from the web, a web crawl and Wikipedia and different sources. And this, and it's basically looking at given um, a given context, so maybe a thousand or so words, um, what is a likely next word or next set of words? So that kind of simplistic framing actually gives really, really powerful results because it's looked at so much data, it can give quite good uh, coherent responses based on a, a prompt. So if I share a screen again, share that one. Okay, hopefully you can see now my little GPT-3 playground. So you can ask it any question you like, and you can have a lot of fun <laughs> with GPT-3. But as a good example, I'll ask it to brainstorm some ideas combining AI and Scotland, okay? So this is a fairly niche question, okay? There's like, what, 40 of us here today? Um, not many other people will be asking this question, but the model has been trained on so much data. It has seen examples of what AI as a concept is, what Scotland is as a concept. So I'll do this live now. And they say never work with children and animals. We'll probably add um, machine learning to that as well, but we'll see what comes up. <laughs> okay, so these are the examples generated. So developing AI-powered Scottish fold cats as pets. That's a very particular breed of Scottish cat. Okay, developing an AI powered whiskey distilling robot. So Loch Ness Monsters in there, <laughs> Scottish Gaelic speakers. So we asked it to combine AI in Scotland, but it's in its corpus knowledge. It has seen examples of Scotland associated with whiskey distilling, Scotland associated with Loch Ness Monster, um, Scotland associated with Gaelic, okay, as another language. It has all that context. But the most impressive part is that it can put all that context together and generate natural language that reads um, sensibly. Now, these might not be sensible ideas, okay, granted, but it is very, very high quality English language text that makes sense. We gave it a prompt to brainstorm some ideas and it gave us back those ideas, which I think is uh, really, really powerful. So that's the general overview of NLP, of what it is, understanding and generation and combining those into new areas. And I'll give you a quick now, um, 
overview of what we do at Student Voice in terms of how that's used in education. So what we do is make use of student comments within higher education in particular, but also further education in the schools. And this is the sort of comments you give when a bit of paper was slid after a lecture and there's some agree, disagree questions and a big text box of any other comments. It's that any other comments we work with because when you're trying to improve teaching and that is student voices real mission it's those free text comments that tell you what you're doing right what you're doing wrong and how you can improve things so we're looking to be able to analyze those comments and basically fundamentally categorize them into useful categories for educators to see what's working well what's not what do students like what do they dislike which areas should be improved um, and do that at a large scale. Because as you can imagine at university level, many, many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these comments are generated and they can't all be labeled by hand. We want to do this across institutions. So there's data everywhere and the university sector is a really good example because each university has this huge trove of these student comments normally sitting in the proverbial sort of filing cabinet somewhere in a folder somewhere on someone's computer and they're all individually there but being able to get in and compare them and analyze them all using the same models is incredibly powerful we also want to be doing things around demographics so if you want to improve teaching and access to education in particular it's not enough to look at everyone uh, as a whole you want to be splitting by demographics um, how does the male and female experience differ at university younger and older students working parents all these different demographics um, of students we can split them out and see what are they talking about what are the concepts they are using in their text and then we can group those and show universities okay these groups of students have these issues you can help them in these ways and finally, we want to make it useful for institutions. So we, there's no point doing this analysis. A lot of uh, machine learning and ALP is a lot of fun to do, but unless you're making something useful for someone at the end of the day, there's no real point doing it. So we, we take a, a large number of pains to really make this as useful as possible for universities so they can actually use it in their own workflows. So we have to build an automatic classifier and machine learning, a set of machine learning models. You have to train these models so we use supervised learning. So we give them examples of text. So a given sentence is about exams. A given sentence is about supervision, et cetera. And then this allows us to, what we want to do is build these models and use them across many universities to allow comparisons. And for that, you need very consistent models and a consistent data structures in each university, which again is another challenge for us as a company. We use deep learning. So we use a large language models. I won't dwell on that. But basically, they contain all that semantic meaning of the concepts of words. It's not just matching words. It's about the concepts. And we can basically layer on top of that. So we use these huge models of the English language, and we can put a little bit of layer of education context on top to be really, really powerful. These models are quite slow to train, take a lot of computation to uh, plow through all these examples and generate these models. But the flip side of that is they're very quick to run. So as fast, once we've got these models in place, as fast as, as universities can generate, as students can generate comments, we can process them, which really changes the game because previously university would spend weeks or months manually labeling a small subset of this data. But as this year, we analyze the full university's data within one working day, which totally changes the game. And finally, we want to, test and validate these models. Now, I won't dwell on this because this is something that Lorna will talk a lot more about, but we separate the data into training and testing sets so we can always try and compare our models against a known good value, basically, and that's some human labeled data. Because fundamentally, you don't get anything for free in supervised learning, so we need to supply it with a large number of manually labeled uh, comments, so over 100,000 to date, uh, manually labeled comments that go into our models. It takes time and effort. But once you have those models, you can do incredible things with them. And this is done by people sitting down, looking at a given sentence and applying a label to it. And we get multiple people to look at one label. And whenever there's a disagreement, we sort of do a tiebreaker. So we have a really robust system for getting this training data because the quality of the training data is of utmost importance. And then comparing. So what these models allow us to do is to look at what a wide variety of data and use this consistent model. And that allows comparison. So it's a really important part of what we do and what these models can do. It's not just that they can label things X or Y, it's that you can label everything with a consistent uh, model, look back in time, look across universities and really get a 
a useful insight into what is going on. And that's a quick run through of NLP, a quick run through of what we do at Student Voice in terms of education. And obviously I'll be happy to answer any, any questions afterwards, uh, but now I will pass over to Lorna. I will just stop sharing my screen. Thank you. While Lona gets started, just a reminder, everyone, to please pop your questions into the chat. Thank you. So thanks very much. Uh, thanks for letting me come here and speak to you all today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about NLP in the NHS. And um, um, oops. I'm going to start just by very quickly giving you a, a wee intro to the Medical Devices Unit, because we're quite a unique team within the NHS. Um, our main function is to design and develop medical devices, both hardware and software devices, where there's an unmet clinical need and no commercial product available. Um, we also get involved in things like device evaluation and teaching, um, but, but our, our main bread and butter is around the design and development of medical devices. So I head up the software and informatics team, um, and I'm going to tell you about where we're applying NLP in our work. So I'll, I'll start by showing you what most NHS data looks like, and it looks like this, and this is an extract from a clinic letter. So clinic letters are generated by clinicians who will generally dictate what's happened during their encounter with a patient. And this is then typed up and it's sent off to another clinician, and a copy of the letter will be added to the patient's electronic record. Um, so in some cases, the dictation will be automatically converted to text, which is a, a form of NLP, but, that, but that's not the type of thing that I'm going to be discussing today. So um, what I'm going to be talking about is, is taking this unstructured data and, and structuring it and doing something useful with it. So as you can see, this we are working with with unstructured data and all the useful bits are, are lumped in here together in this clinic letter. Um, the example I'm showing you here is, a, is a, an extract from an ophthalmology letter, um, but most clinical specialties are exactly the same. And this is in, it's not just unique to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, this is in every health board in Scotland, it's probably all across the UK and all across the world. There's some pockets where people are doing different things, but but most of the time, all of our health data is tied up in these clinics letters. So the reason why this is the case, um, that could take another talk, um, but I just want to get across to you today that this is where we are and, and most of our useful data is tied up in these clinic letters. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the type of information that we have in a clinic letter is about diagnosis and medication and family history. Um, we've got other symptoms in here, um, you can see that are highlighted in pink, and then you've got other uh, clinical measures that can be used to, um, to look at disease progression. Um, so these ones in blue here. Um, so, uh, so all of this information is relevant to deciding on, on the best care pathway for this patient. Um, and most of this information doesn't exist elsewhere. Uh, this clinic letter, it's not a summary of a lot of disparate structured information. This is the single source of truth um, within the patient's electronic record for a lot of this information. So the NLP problems that my team are working on is how to extract and structure this uh, type of information and help clinicians make informed decisions um, to improve our clinical services. So um, what we would like to get to is, is, is set, allowing clinicians to do decision making with structured data. And if we could extract and structure all of the clinical data, um, we would be able to present clinicians with a very concise view of all the information they require to make decisions, and that could lead to the patient receiving the most appropriate care. So we can summarise everything that's gone before, we can plot markers of disease progression, and we can allow clinicians to see at a glance how the patient's progressing and the impact of treatment on, on this progression. So uh, this is probably seems like common sense and, and you might reasonably expect that this type of display is, is what your clinician's looking at when you're turning up for a clinic appointment. Um, but sadly, that is not the case. Um, so what used to happen uh, in hospitals was that clinicians would get a physical set of notes um, as shown in this picture here. And they would flick through them and they would take pen and paper notes as they went and they would summarise all of the relevant clinical details so that when you were sitting in front of them in clinic, you would have this wee pen and paper note um, that you could refer to. So we've largely moved away from these physical case notes, not completely, but we have largely moved away from them. But we've replaced it 
with a, a like for like electronic system. So, so rather than a, a system that, that kind of summarizes this information, it presents it nicely to clinicians, we've just given them a system that they have to, rather than flicking through the notes, they have to search through a whole load of PDFs. And they still use the pen and paper and they take notes as they go through all these PDFs. Um, so this is really unbelievably inefficient. Uh, it's really unfair on the clinicians. Uh, they need to make a lot of really complicated decisions quickly. Um, and, and we're forcing them to do that based on information that's really difficult to access. So that's why we are working on these types of problems. Um, so the entity recognition is the kind of thing that we, we are interested in. And this is it's a hard problem to solve in general, but in healthcare, it's complicated by other factors, um, such as the need to extract numeric data. A lot of the time when you're doing entity recognition, you're just looking for for labeling um, and looking to pull out different words in the context, but we're actually looking to pull out numeric data here, so that makes it a bit difficult. There's also a scarcity of, of training data and representative data models because we need very specific um, data models to work with based on healthcare information and, and, and health terms. Um, and there's a real difficulty in, in sharing information between organisations because all of these clinic notes contain a lot of really sensitive um, patient information um, and it's really hard to anonymise that to then share with other organisations. So we'll, that, that makes it quite tricky. Um, but the main thing that makes entity recognition like a hard enough to crack in healthcare is that we can't afford to get it wrong. Um, so in other industries, there might be an acceptable margin of error, but in healthcare, we need to get it right all the time. Um, so a lot of the work that we are doing is layering verification, validation and risk mitigation techniques on top of these really well recognised NLP techniques that, that Stuart mentioned. Um, and the reason that we're working on this is that it is essential um, to service improvement. And if we can provide structured information to clinicians, we can improve the efficiency, we can improve the eff efficacy and we can improve the safety of many of our clinical services. And we can then provide a gateway for more um, advanced decision support technologies to, to layer on top of that. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the, the NLP tasks that we work on. So, so we do some really low level stuff. We do like looking at regular expressions, um, which is, is a set of predefined rules. And we use that mostly to extract numeric information. We've found that that's a lot more um, efficient than, than apply, applying um, some of these uh, neural network uh, models that you can apply. Um, so the way that we will construct these, um, these rules is that we'll, we'll get them to look for a particular term. So in this case, it would be intraocular pressure. Um, we'll be looking for a numeric value followed by a particular type of units. Um, so in this one, it's uh, millimetres of mercury. Um, and then we'd be looking for a side. So where a lot of the time in the body, you've got a left and a right side and you're interested in what's happening in both. So in this, you would be interested in, in, in working out what's happening in the right eye, what's happening in the left eye. So the examples I'm showing you, this first one is, is very easy. So you've got your intraocular pressure, you've got mentions of that in this sentence. And then you've also got your, your unit, your 13, and then you've got your, 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 the, the unit of measurement, which is millimetres of mercury. And then it's followed by this word right. So we know that that's, we can be fairly confident that that's 13, uh, the pressure in that eye is 13 millimetres of mercury in the right and eight millimetres of mercury in the left. So that's, that's a fairly straightforward task. But we also get examples within these patient notes because they're not structured. There's no, there's lots of different clinicians reporting on these um, and there's no set way of doing it. But we, so we can get examples where intraocular pressures were 20 right and left and pre-treatment pressures were 26 and 28. Now, as a human reading that, I can make sense of that. I know what that's about. But trying to code up rules so that a computer can understand that is pretty difficult. Um, so these are some of the, the kind of harder cases that we'll come across. Um, and uh, these regular expressions can be really useful for extracting these numeric values, but they are difficult to capture every possible variation. Um, we also do um, some of the, the kind of neural network stuff that, that Stuart was talking about. Um, we use this for concept extraction, um, and we use that to extract um, kind of terms like diagnosis, looking for medication, family history, other symptoms. Um, so uh, we, we've built, we're building on work that's been done by the Cogstack team at King's College London, and we use unsupervised and then supervised learning to fine tune our models to a particular clinical specialty. 
Um, and then we use these models for, for meta-annotation extraction. So this is extracting not only mention of the medical concept, but also the medical concept, but also the context uh, in, in, with it, in which it was mentioned. So things like um, to do with negation, the, the patient has cancer or the patient does not have cancer. We've got getting the context is, is, is very important there. Um, things like who, who is actually, who are they talking about? Um, it's the kind of mention of things related to the patient. And then they can also, if we're talking about family history, they can have things related to, it can be uh, the patient's mother had cancer and that can also be in the letter. So it's important we really pull out the, not just these concepts, but all, uh, also uh, the context with which they're mentioned in these letters. So they're the kind of tasks that, that we're working on. And then the kind of stuff that we layer on on the top of it, well, it's verification, validation and risk mitigation. So for verification, what we're interested in is, are we pulling out what we intended to? Um, so the way that we do that um, is we apply these techniques, um, these kind of well-recognized techniques, but then we also develop our own confidence scoring around those um, so that we could, there's certain conditions where we can be fairly confident that we're getting it right. And then there's ones that we're fairly confident we're getting it wrong. And then there's a the gray area in the middle. Um, so, so we use a confidence scores to try and uh, identify which is which. We can use clinical reference ranges as part of this. So we can, if we're pulling out numeric values, we can say, is that sensible? Is that a value that can exist? Is it, is it an intraocular pressure that makes sense? Or is it too high or is it too low? Um, so we can apply those kind of reference ranges to sense check the information that we're pulling out. We can look at sequential ordering. So um, if, if a lot of this is, um, these are um, chronic conditions that we're, we're looking at and the patients attended multiple times and we see how they're getting on. So we can refer to information that were previously extracted on that patient, does it appear in the next letter? Can we be confident that that's what they're talking about? Um, and then we also do a lot of, for the, for the ones that we're sure that we're getting right, we do random sampling just to make sure um, and do a manual review of those. Um, and then for the, for a lot of the for the ones that we're, we're getting wrong, we make sure that we would do manual review before um, with a, a, the clinical team um, before we would be, be sure to extra, uh, accept that. Uh, in terms of validation, so verification, are we pulling out what we intended to, but validation is, are we pulling out the right thing? So medical data is quite difficult. It's, um, it's hard to get the right context. We have to be sure that we are understanding the requirements of the clinicians, and that can be quite hard when you're not working in that clinical area. So we do a lot of research looking at clinical guidelines and published papers. We also were really privileged um, within the MDU because we've got access to all these clinical services. We're working in the same organisation. So we can go, we can interview them, and we can actually go and observe and see what they're doing and making sure we really understand how they're using this information. And then we also do user acceptance testing at the end to make sure that they're comfortable with what we've produced. Um, in terms of risk mitigations, this is about putting safeguards in place. Um, so we, we tend to try and use multiple different techniques to solve the same problem. And then we look at the results um, from all of those and where we get agreement, we can be more confident um, that we've done the right thing there. Um, we talked about the confidence scoring before. We're very conservative with our scoring. We always err on the side of caution. Um, and we, we also, for us in the medical devices unit, we adhere to medical device design and development standards. Um, so there are a lot of standards around uh, software as a medical device. Um, we've got standards around quality management. Um, we've got standards around risk management, uh, design and development life cycle, um, and also around usability engineering. So I'm not going to dwell too much on these. Um, but just that these are the kind of standards that we're working to, and, and that's how we can we can add these extra safeguards in place um, on top of uh, these traditional NLP techniques. Um, so the what I was trying to get across is that, um, or, or, or what we're looking to do next is that it's really difficult to do this. Uh, it, uh, entity recognition and generalize it across the clinical specialties. We need to apply it to lots of them. It's really difficult to do that. Um, we, we know that, but what we want to try and work out is, is, is there any, any value in generalizing the approach? So we're working at the moment, we're working on uh, use cases and ophthalmology and, and uh, prostate cancer. Um, and we're looking if we can take that learning and, and apply it to other areas within the health code. So that's the, that's the focus of our group. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions.
That's great. Thank you so much, Lona. And thank you for those questions. They're coming in. Uh, we'll, we'll leave the questions till the end, if that's okay. Uh, but uh, last but not least, we now hand over to Gianluca. Yeah, thank you, Steph. And thank you, uh, Lorna Stewart. They were amazing presentation. And first of all, nice to meet you. Um, I'm Gianluca. I am the CEO and co-founder at Indigo AI. As Steph was saying, uh, we are a B2B software as a service platform that it's using artificial intelligence in order to allow businesses improve the communication with the users. Um, we've been selected by the AI Accelerator that we just accomplished in the Bias Center in Edinburgh as one of the most important, the, the best company in the cohort. And also we've been attending the EIE Engage Invest Exploit 2022. So we, we will be back in Edinburgh by the end of the year. This is happening because we are moving the company. We have a, a lot of skills in applying AI to natural language processing. And I guess that today I am here in order to share our expertise in the business or the business perspective of natural language processing. So also I want to share with you at the end of the speech, uh, maybe a little demo. I have no slides, but I want to show you how the technology is working because we can really put our hands uh, into the concept that uh, before Lorna Stewart were saying. So we will see how natural la language understanding is working. We will see how natural language generation is working and how those technology can be combined in an easy way to allow companies uh, of any size to easily adopt this kind of technology. Because our perception as a company is that uh, what we are talking about, so natural language processing, it's something that is super difficult. It's super powerful but it's difficult for companies to be really adopted. So it's something that is, uh, has a lot of potential, but it's not so easily accessible for anyone. And to give you the full picture, this is a concept that has been inside our DNA, DNA since the very first moment of the corporation, because we started our, our, our company building a natural language processing engine, and we were willing to help people get the best answer every time. But as soon as we found out our first customer that was buyer, so a big pharmaceutical company, we understood that the limit of this technology was not in the capability of understanding, but was in the freedom that uh, the people that were working in buyer had in order to really manipulate it, in order to really control this kind of technology. So we had seen since the very first moment that they were really struggling. So this is the reason why we built our company and also the mission of our uh, what we want to really provide to the, the business that we are working with. We understood that customer communication, because we are talking about customer communication, is critical for company success. We have seen companies that have spent billions of euros by perfecting their services, by perfecting their products, their value proposition. But if you think about that, nothing matters if they are poorly interacting with their users. So companies like Bayer have tried to adopt some conversational artificial intelligence technology, also natural language processing, for instance. But uh, building such a technology is a long process. It's a complex journey that involves many people and often deliver low performances. So this is the reason why we as a company, we have built a no-code tool in order to allow anyone inside the organization uh, even if they were working in the business, in the marketing or in the customer care, to easily build a deep learning, custom deep learning model based on their needs. So actually the goal or uh, what we want to accomplish is to allow anyone, even if it's not a data scientist, to act like, like a data scientist. So we are really democratizing the access of this kind of technology. So this is the reason why we are gaining a lot of traction and we have been lucky and also good in um, deploying our technology for some of the most innovative businesses worldwide. So we're working in any sector such as um, banking, for instance, Santander Consumer Bank is, our, is one of our customers in the pharmaceutical industry, such as Bayer, but also online services such as Just Tea Takeaways or Lavazza, for instance. So we have seen a lot of use cases. And one thing that you really want to focus your attention is that uh, Natural language processing and also technology more in general, it's important. But the most important thing that you can get out of a technology is their use cases. So we have seen that uh, one of the most, the hottest 
application of this kind of natural language processing technology is to empower the customer experience delivered by the users. So this is something that you can really accomplish because if you have an amazing technology, it is allowing really any corporation to understand what people were saying, you will really use this information to improve the experience that you deliver. But moreover, you can also get other benefits out of this kind of relationship. For instance, you can get savings because of course it's an automated relation, but most important than saving are insights. Because if you're understanding what people are saying, you can really understand why they are writing to you. So which are the trends in the meaning of the question that they were uh, trying to ask to your companies, to your clicks and stuff like that. So this is powerful information that you can really use in order to actively uh, improve your processes, improve your services and improve your product. So actually, I guess that one of the most powerful things that you can do with the natural languages is technology is this one. So more or less, I give you uh, like some hints about how we are using this technology to empower businesses of any kind of sites, of any kind of dimension, but we want to empower people that are working in the business departments, not people in the technical side, because they can really, just right now, they can really apply their technology, but we want to really make this technology accessible. And this is the reason why we want to show you in practice some of the concepts that we have explained before, such as understanding, generation. So to easily allow you how it's easy and how any corporation can really, uh, in a matter of minutes, for real minutes, can really improve the customer experience. So everything is related on data because we are talking about deep learning. So the platform, it's a way for companies um, of any size actually to build the best um, custom deep learning model based on the data specific to the use case. So actually I'm sharing the screen so you can see. Um, there we are. And this is uh, the tool, uh, I mean, a platform that can be used in order to really apply natural language processing. And this is a demo environment, of course. Uh, it's a demo environment that uh, it's easy to share because it's talking about the CS of Las Vegas. That is one of the biggest tech fair worldwide. And we have been lucky to get there. So we had the need to show the technology when we were there. And so this is the reason why we build this kind of uh, uh, demo environment. Here, just by going, giving you a walkthrough of this demo environment, you will be able to understand the, the drivers of the natural language processing that we explained before. So you see, this is a, a powerful technology, but you really should apply a lot of different models, as Stuart was saying, in order to really extract the maximum information that you can get out of the sentence made by your users. Here on the left, for instance, you can see the topics. This is the knowledge base. This is the data that you're using in order to instruct and to teach uh, um, the, the, the artificial intelligence. You can see that there are some topics that are already owned by the machine, such as small Smalltalks, for instance, you can ask to a virtual assistant because this is a chatbot in age and it's giving you the answer. But you can ask for a lot of things, for instance, uh, which is your birth date or stuff like that. Uh, any company is able to build their own topic. So just by here, and we add a topic that is called general, in which there are some answer related to generic questions that user can make uh, to the CS visual assistant, for instance. This is a title, and this is how an answer is made. This is a title, this is the answer that the user receive if a user is asking something that is similar to the sentence that you can find here. So here you can see the powerful capabilities of a natural language processing technology, because even if the user is expressing itself in a totally different way, the goal of the machine to do the understanding part is actually to rely on what he has learned over time and find which is the best answer that can be delivered. So this is a question about price, but actually you can uh, uh, really put inside the workspace any question that you would like to ask. And giving you a glimpse about how this is working. So if we go here, actually with one click, uh, we can put uh, the virtual assistant here on the bottom right on the website of the CS of Las Vegas. We can try to ask some sentence and we can see the answer. Every answer is taken in real time from the workspace here. 
So you can see how in a bank, for instance, uh, in a corporate such as in insurance or a, a pharmaceutical company, how it's easy to really uh, control the artificial intelligence because they have a tool that is accessible, no code that anyone can really use. So actually here you can ask for also more specific questions such as this one. And this one is actually the answer that you see here. One of the most important feature, as you are also was saying, is the capability of the machine to learn over time. So I want to show you how this is easy uh, and how you can really improve the natural language processing capability by asking something that the machine does not know. So you can see how the business is really using this kind of technologies, really implementing the machine learning side inside the DNA. I know for sure that there are no information about the dates, so we can try to ask when the CS will be held. As you can see here, the answer is not known. So the machine is saying, uh, I'm sorry, I know how to answer. And actually what our customers do or any business is to get here and add a new sentence such as this one. CS will be held in January next year. We can try to add some example questions as you can see here so you can write which are the date for the cs for instance and here you can see another thing that is the gpt3 so the generation so we are asking the machine to add the more examples that are completely generated by the machine so actually you can use the eye to train an ai you click on train here so the machine is learning so it's educating itself on the data that you add and you can try to ask again. So the question here was when the CS will be held and we can really try again. As you can see, the answer that we just put is the answer that is delivered. So this is the way every business is finally in control of the AI and can finally use in order to improve the customer experience, get savings and also get customer insight of the conversation. This is it. I hope it was easy. And if you have any question, of course, feel free to ask. That is brilliant. Thank you very much. And look at, thank you very much to Stuart and Lorna too. Um, so interesting. I lost track of time. Uh, we, we, we have uh, nine minutes for questions. Uh, we have some uh, great questions in the chat already. So uh, I would normally actually invite the audience member who asked the question to ask it, but in the interest of time, I hope you guys don't mind. I'm going to read it out if that's okay. Um, I'm going to start out with a, a, a generic question that I think applies to all three of you guys. And then there's some very spe specific healthcare ones uh, for you, Lorna, in the chat. Um, but I'll start with the, the um, question from Mike. Um, in your text labeled models, how do you deal with a comment that matches two or more labels? I guess that kind of applies to yeah. across all three uses. Yeah, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So we take sometimes you get very large comments from students, for instance, many paragraphs. But what we do is, as a first step, break them all down into individual sentences. And then we apply every single model we have to that sentence. So it's not picking and choosing. Any given sentence can have multiple labels. You can be talking about multiple things, um, especially when you're talking more colloquially. You have these large compound sentences when you talk about three or four different concepts in one sentence. And um, so we apply all the labels that match. So th that's, that's really it, really. We don't try and limit ourselves because natural language being what it is frequently includes lots of different concepts. And in terms of sentiment as well, a given sentiment will usually be limited to a sentence, but a given comment may have, you know, the, um, Lorna Harper was, was great, but the Dr. Gray wasn't good, right? to one positive, one negative. So then we can combine those together and say, look, that had a positive aspect and a negative aspect. So we're trying not to make these decisions in a binary sense. We're basically stacking up the, this knowledge we get from the classifiers on a sentence by sentence basis. So hopefully that answers your question, Mike, from, from my point of view. That's brilliant. Uh, Gianluca and Lorna, do you guys want to add anything? No, actually Stuart, in my opinion, said everything, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll go with Stuart's answer. Ours is a bit more, um, it, it tends not to be, um, like the, the tends to be less opportunity for things to fall within two different categories in, in the kind of data that I'm dealing with. It tends to be kind of one thing or the other uh, in, in most cases. That's great. Thank you. Uh, the next two questions are, are, are aimed at Lona, <laughs> I believe. Um, and, and I'm going to preface it with a bit of, you know, I have a bit of a healthcare background and like NLP does kind of 
years ago when I first started was seen as like the holy grail <laughs> in like in healthcare. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of challenges around that. But um, anyway, a question from Vicky Crichton. Um, how does the fine tuning process work? How much does it rely on the understanding of the context of the topic? And is that an ongoing process? Um, so I would, Vicky, I would refer you to the, the, um, the Cogstack suite of tools that the that, that Kings have developed. They've taken a lot of tools that have been developed across universities um, across the UK, and they've kind of put a wee polish on a lot of them to make them accessible. A lot of them were only really used, uh, able to be used in, in research settings, but they've, they've kind of tweaked them and, and made them more accessible. So that, that, that those are the tools that we work with. And um, so that's our starting point, And that's um, that's what we use um, for, for doing our models and for fine tuning them. There's the MedCat trainer, um, which um, you're able to, um, to, to train your models using that. So we're really lucky within, there was another comment I've seen in the chat that um, it's difficult to get to get access to data. Now we have some of that, but, but we're in a more privileged position in that we're within the NHS. So we're not having to apply for, uh, we do have to, and we've got to apply with information governance, but, but we can get access to a whole load of patient data. So what we can do is for our training data, like for instance, we're working on one of the projects is on uh, is in ophthalmology, but it's very specific to glaucoma that we're interested in ophthalmology. So we can use some of that other ophthalmology data for our training data, um, and then we can uh, test it on the glaucoma data. So, so we're lucky in that context. In terms of, is it an ongoing process? Well, it depends on our application. So we have two applications that we're working on at the moment. One is in prostate cancer, and in the prostate cancer case, we're only actually using regular expressions um, because we're trying to display that information to patients, uh, to clinicians in real time, so that they can make decisions. And we haven't really worked out how to do that in a, a safe way and allow things to update. Um, the other project that we're working on, the, um, the ophthalmology one, the glaucoma one, is we're trying to populate uh, the, the ophthalmology across Scotland have procured a new um, electronic patient record specific to ophthalmology. And we're trying to populate it with all the historic um, health information that's sitting in other electronic patient records across Scotland. So in that case, it's a kind of once and done, like we're waiting until it's done and then we'll transfer it to the new electronic patient record. So we can allow things to develop over time and, and, and allow those med, um, models to get better. Um, but it, it just depends on, on, on in the context. Hopefully, as we get better at these um, projects and we'll get a bit more experience, we'll be able to kind of meet in the middle somewhere um, and, and, and do more than just regular expressions when we're trying to sell the, the data up live. That's great. Thank you. I think you've answered the first part of Aileen Casey's question around accessing the data. But um, but in terms of her second part, uh, you know, uh, are you using the MedCat toolkit? And she's interested in know what tools you are using for the annotation of unstructured text. Uh, yep. So we are we're using uh, the MedCat toolkit. Um, it's it, where we've been able to work with um, the people at Kings as well. With, um, we told them what we were doing. They were really interested. They've not really had anywhere with like other than their own research group that's tried to apply this in, in a healthcare setting. So they were really interested with what we were doing and they have been really helpful. And so, yeah, we, we're using all those tools and they're great. They're, they're on there, they're, they're open source and there's, there's a lot of really good tutorials um, there for, for using those tools. So if anybody's interested in this kind of thing, I would recommend that they, they go and have a look at that. Um, if there are any uh, researchers out there that are interested in this kind of thing, like we, we are trying to improve clinical services and, and that's the kind of angle that we're focusing on, but there's a whole research angle to what we're doing that we don't really have the capacity to, to, to pick up on. So if there's anybody really interested in, in, in doing some of this research and, and writing these papers, then um, please do get in touch. Brilliant, thank you. And I think Vicky has a, a follow up to your answer. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm not NHS, so interesting to hear you have a tool to use. I assume that's less likely to be the case in other sectors, like in Stuart's example, so it needs to be developed from scratch. Stuart? Yeah, yeah, so that's true. So it's for two reasons, really. So Lorna's in a far more constraints than I am in terms of, as she said, her validation, the risk of being wrong is so much more work. So that's where a lot of these tools are very specific for healthcare because they have to be way more robust. Um, I'm going from a more generic side and the tools in the background we use are the fantastic open source libraries available to everybody. And what we're doing is then 
taking a very particular view and education focused view of how we apply those tools. Our training set is education focused, um, our results, the analysis, the outputs we generate are education focused, but the fundamental tools are generic. So that the large language models are just models of the English language. So it is just all the whole language. You can train on anything, but we happen to train it very much so on a very particular education set. So we don't have, there's no education specific tools. Uh, we basically, in the same way that um, there are in healthcare, but that just means we've got to make them ourselves. But because our constraints are a bit more relaxed, we can do that. Whereas that'd be very, very difficult to do from scratch in a healthcare environment. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we're coming to the end of our time. So um, I just also want to add, we didn't have any direct questions to Gianluca, but I just want to say thank you so much for showing us the demo. I think it's really interesting for people to actually see the tool in action. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, but thanks. yeah, no, I mean, that's all that's left for me to do is uh, say thank you so much to Stuart. Lorna and uh, Gianluca uh, for their time today and telling us about the fantastic work they're doing. Um, hope to be able to send out their slides uh, if possible after this um, and their contact details too, if you're wanting to get in touch, uh, like Lorna suggested, uh, to, uh, if you had any research interest in this area or you know, to, just to have a chat. It's all about making connections. Um, and uh, like I said, we've re recorded this event, so we hope to get it um, released on our website uh, in the coming weeks as well. So uh, anyone who wasn't able to attend today would be able to catch up. And I also wanted to flag up our next event, uh, which is on Wednesday, the 7th of September. And it's slightly linked to what Alona was saying. It's about uh, medical AI, how the UK government's good machine learning practice principles can be put into practice. Uh, so uh, my colleague Dawn will put a link in the chat uh, so you can sign up to that. Um, but uh, I'm going to end with final words, one final sentence from each of you about NLP and how amazing it is. Uh, and uh, we'll close off on there. Stuart. Okay, I think um, we're just at the very beginning of the impact we can have on uh, students and wider society on making these improvements. The data is there. NLP will let us actually use that data for something useful. Thank you. And over to Lona. Does Stuart have to go first? <laughs> no, I, I would say the same thing. We, we, are, we are just starting to, to, to really uh, unpick this problem, and but it will make such a difference in healthcare if we can start to, to, to structure our data. Fantastic. And Gianluca, final words. I to really, yeah, yeah, last words. So the most, uh, I mean, very heavy words, but I want to say that I really believe that this is a technology that will change the world and how we are interacting with machine. And if you think about the advancement in this sector in the last year, it's crazy. So I really cannot believe what will happen in the next five years. I'm so excited to understand that. That's wonderful. And that's a fantastic note to end on. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and we will uh, contact everyone who attended today uh, with details on where to find the recording, etc. So uh, have a lovely day, everyone. Uh, stay cool. It's toasty out there. And uh, we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you again to Stuart, Lorna and Gianluca.